This is part two of the introductory lecture. This is just continuing with the discussion of the shared culture of reading and the importance of reading in the transmission of culture in the early 19th century. If you think about today and the many ways in which you can have access to cultural materials, you know, looking on the computer, reading a newspaper, the internet, iTunes, um, videos, television, there are an infinite number of ways with the onset of technology that you can have access to cultural productions like songs, albums, books, comic books, any sort of music, art. But in the 19th century, the primary mode for the transmission of culture is print um, in terms of a shared culture of information and what people have access to and the rise of newspapers in this period too, which we'll talk a little bit more about next week. Um, the other way of transmitting culture in this time period is the traveling show. Um, theaters, actors who went from town to town to town performing, or people like um, P.T. Barnum who take exhibitions from town to town and putting things on display. So in the early part of the 19th century, that's really how culture is transmitted. But if you think about this shared culture of reading, I'd like you to just first think of Noah Webster, who was a Yale graduate, who was very interested in language and American language. And he argued very early on, um, even when the Constitution was being written, that we needed an American language, an American English separate from Great Britain. And he published to this end the American Dictionary of the English Language in 1828. He wanted to standardize both spelling and English in America, adopting ER on words like center and theater, not RE, like it is in England, color, no U, music, no K, wagon with one G instead of two, as it was in English at that time, as well as adding Native American and particularly American words that had developed in the time um, when America became separate. So words like skunk and squash and hickory and chowder became part of the American lexicon in Webster's Dictionary, uh, which had initially over 70,000 entries. And Whitman also wrote, and you can read this in, in Leaves of Grass this week in that preface, the English language befriends the grand American expression. It's brawny enough and limber enough and full enough on the tough stock of a race who through all change of circumstances was never without the idea of political liberty, which is the animus of all liberty. It has attracted the terms of daintier and gayer and subtler and more elegant tongues. It's the powerful language of resistance. It's the dialect of common sense. It's the speech of the proud and melancholy races and of all who aspire. It's the chosen tongue to express growth, faith, self-esteem, freedom, justice, equality, friendliness, amplitude, prudence, decision, and courage. It's the medium that shall well nigh express the inexpressible. And for both Noah Webster and for Whitman, language is one of the arbiters of this transmission of culture, one of the things that really makes it possible, right, that words and common language bring people together, bring Americans together in a shared and common culture. Reading is also in this, in this time period a means of social control. This is actually the frontispiece for the Liberty Bell, which was an abolitionist publication. This is a time where slavery is still alive and well, very much alive and well in the United States. And in the southern states, slaves were not allowed to learn to read or write because in that reading and writing was power, was access to knowledge and culture and education. So as you can see during Reconstruction after the Civil War in 1877, when Winslow Homer paints Sunday morning in Virginia, you can see young formerly enslaved children gathered around reading and learning how to read, where an older woman is sort of separated from this reading and from this new youthful activity. 
This is a very classic sort of American cultural painting of the time period, too. It's 1863. It's Eastman Johnson. He was actually a main painter. And this is his evening newspaper. And you can see the kind of relaxed pose and demeanor. Um, the, the subject of the painting is chewing on a corncob pipe. He's leaning back in his chair, but he's reading the newspaper, which is this common cultural connection in the 19th century. Or Richard Caton Woodville's War News from Mexico, 1848. And you can see how news was spread through the newspaper and who's interested and who has access to this reading. Um, the Mexican-American War is when we acquire the Gadsden Purchase, New Mexico, um, Texas, California, Arizona, all of that land in the Southwest. And both this painting and the next painting sort of support a Western expansion United States, which is very much a part of 19th century culture, and a white male dominated democracy, which is also very much the story of 19th century American culture. You can see two figures on the margins here. A woman also wanting to hear the news. She's peeking out the window in the right hand corner. And a young African American boy in tattered clothes and an African American man sitting on the stairs and they're not quite with the rest of the audience. But American expansion and also the question of whether or not slavery would expand West is very much on their minds as well. Authorized readers of the 19th century, politically anyways, were people who could vote. Um, by mid-century, American newspapers had the largest circulation of any newspapers in the world. This is William Sidney Mount's California News from 1850. And you can see here the very same thing. The women and the African-American man are both on the margins of receiving this news. This is about the gold rush at this point. So if we're talking about American culture beyond reading in this time period, art is very much central to many people's minds. And so the question is, what could truly be an American form or genre of painting? What did America have that was different from Europe in some measurable way? And what we really did have that was different was a very unique landscape. And so a school of painting developed in New York, not a physical school, school as in a group of painters working around the same ideas and topics called the Hudson River School. It was led by Thomas Cole, who you see here, who moved from England to Ohio when he was 17, and then later to New York when he was 25. And in 1825, he made his first trip up the Hudson River and into the Catskill Mountains before moving there permanently in 1836. And the types of things that Cole painted really showcased a rugged American wilderness and wilderness on a grand scale. Uh, this is view on the Catskill early autumn from 1837. You can see the mountains in the background. And the people are included here too, but they're not the focus of the painting. Uh, they give a sense of the vast nature, the vast natural landscape of America. Asher Durand and Frederick Edwin Church, who you see here on the left and right, are also important members of the Hudson River School. Uh, this is another of uh, Thomas Cole's painting, Landscape for Last of the Mohicans in 1827. What's interesting about this is that this was a mural that was commissioned to be a decoration on a Hudson River steamboat, the technology that made traveling to these areas far more possible for people. And then Catskill Creek again in New York in 1845. And you begin to see these celebrations of a primeval nature untouched by man as a way to express the Hudson River School's feelings about human settlement, really, and industrialization. And, and the Oxbow is one of Cole's most famous paintings. On the left, you can see um, an area untouched by man. And on the right, you can see an area settled by man. And it's an unsettling difference between them. Cole often put himself in the landscape, which represented this 19th century notion that viewing the landscape was in fact a learned behavior. And you can see him right down here um, painting. And you can see the trappings of his art up here as well. And so he's in the very um, natural untouched part looking on the settled part and the way in which industrialization and settlement affects the landscape itself. But who could access these views in the 1900s, and how could they do it? And did they, in fact, really exist? 
And there's an underlying sense of uneasiness in these paintings at technological progress and the after effects of what some historians call the market revolution on the landscape. And so in the 1830s and 40s, any visitor could travel up and down the Hudson River from New York City to the town of Catskill on a fast steamboat, later a train, hop aboard a coach to the Catskill Mountain House, which opened in 1824, check into the hotel, take a carriage onto an observation platform at the top of the falls, or from there follow a footpath to their base. It made a great weekend trip from New York City. And so this wild natural landscape was increasingly commercialized for tourism, right? That more people could have access to it. And in the increased access, the environment itself is threatened and there's a real delicate balance there. Thomas Cole painting an American lake scene. Um, a lot of these artists begin to sketch outside in nature rather than in the studio, though Cole always completed his paintings in the studio. Um, and you can see an oil sketch outside as well. But they constructed the paintings in their studios in Greenwich Village, the 10th Street Studio Building in New York City. Asher B. Durand, uh, when Thomas Cole died in 1848, painted this um, landscape portrait really called Kindred Spirits, and it depicted Cole and the poet William Jennings Bryant in the Catskills. Um, and for Duran, the true province of landscape art was the work of God and the visible creation independent of man. So there's a very much a spiritual place for the natural world here. And this is true of many 19th century American intellectuals, particularly the transcendentalists like Emerson, Thoreau, and Fuller and others, who also believe that in communing with nature, you are also communing with a higher power. And this is another of Duran's paintings, The Beaches of 1845, and you can still see very much a rural America. And so in a lot of ways, these painters were preserving a rural America as America was drastically changing. And they inspire a lot of conservation movements in that sense, too. Church is another member of the Hudson River School. As the Hudson River School became more of a touristy landscape, um, they traveled to places farther out. This way, um, Mount Desert, in Maine, Mount Desert Island, and this is Mount Desert at sunrise in 1850, or the fog off of Mount Desert in 1850. But in painting these landscapes, Twilight at Mount Desert in 1865, they also became invitations for people to come to Maine and consume this scenery, right? That people wanted to see what these, pa what these painters were painting, these great American landscapes that became really definitive part of American art and culture at this time period. Here's Newport Mountain and Mount Desert too, and you also see people inserted here as scale too. It's man against nature, he's trying to pull a log in from the ocean, but it's really nature that's dominating the image. And you might ask today, because we don't look at paintings in the same way or, or as often even anymore, how could a school or style of painting foster specific cultural shifts in America? And to this end, MDI really is a perfect example. Um, because the island really, in many ways, owes its distinction to the painters from New York who discovered this historic area in the early decades of the 1800s. In less than half a century, the island which was first regarded as a rocky, barren, and largely inhospitable wilderness, far distant from emerging metropolitan centers like New York and Boston, became a scenic destination for thousands of Americans, especially the wealthy elite. And these wealthy elite, to protect the beauty of this remote region from overdevelopment, they acquired the land that eventually became the 35,000-acre Acadia National Park, which was the first national park east of the Mississippi River, um, and the cultural work of the landscape painters of the Hudson River School initiated the transformation of Mount Desert around the Civil War into a travel destination, and today over three million people visit the park annually. So not only do these paintings really celebrate the rugged beauty of American landscape, which became a defining aspect of the culture, they also were a bit nos nostalgic for a landscape and a population untouched by technological innovation factories, railroad lines, telegraph lines, etc. And you see this as well um, in Duran's paintings and Old Man's Reminiscences, and you see him here 
sort of looking at the way life used to be um, among the farms and the farmlands in a much simpler time. And the culture in this sense, as William says, is always both traditional and creative, and you see that a little bit here.